So hello, everybody, and welcome. I am so excited to have with us uh, Dr. Clapper today. And let's see, we have him pinned in, on the picture here. Hello, Dr. Clapper, and welcome. And I'm so excited. You, you, have, been, you have been advocating for plant-based health for five decades now. Is that right? And, um, and I, yes? Yes. Um, right. And, uh, and I understand your nutritional advisor to NASA is, is that, um, yeah. So that, that's, that's pretty impressive. And of course you've been involved with True North and, and so many other initiatives. And we'd love to hear you talk a little bit, but let me also add that uh, one of the, the things that I, uh, one of the many things that I so appreciate and honor you for is your initiative to bring bring nutritional education to to medical schools and imagine a world where where our doctors all doctors know the true power of of a plant based lifestyle. So so that is so awesome that you're doing that. Um, would love to hear you if you get a chance to talk a little bit about that and talk, uh, if you would, for a minute about some of your other initiatives. And then what we'll do is we'll get to questions from our audience. And I know Marakita, who's uh, one of my teammates here at We Did It That Health, will have some questions from the audience. So welcome, everybody. We're We Did It That Health, where our mission is to empower grassroots ambassadors to be more effective, inspiring hope and curiosity with our friends and loved ones for a plant-based diet and lifestyle. So with that, welcome Dr. Clapper and please share a little bit more about your, your career and your passion and, and, and your successes and, and everything that you're doing. <laughs> In 30 seconds or less, uh, sure. <laughs> Take a couple uh, of minutes if you like. <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, nobody special. I started out as a, just a standard general practitioner back in the early 1970s. Uh, but uh, I saw my patients were not doing well. They were getting more obese and ill and their blood pressure was going up. I spent my first seven years of medical practice, just chasing numbers, chasing blood sugars and climbing weights and uh, blood pressures, using more and more medications. Uh, and people were still getting heart attacks and strokes. I got so disillusioned with general practice, I left and decided to become an anesthesiologist and uh, spent a couple of years uh, putting people to sleep, literally. Um, and uh, while I was in the cardiovascular anesthesia service, dealing with people's hearts and blood vessels, it dawned on me as day after day, I put people to sleep and watched surgeons pull this yellow guck out of, their, out of the patient's arteries. Uh, that is basically the fat and cholesterol, the animals these people are eating. And there are already studies in the medical literature showing that a plant-based diet uh, will melt these plaques away. And uh, my father died of clogged arteries. I know I've got those genes. And uh, so I was getting the message to change to a plant-based diet. Uh, so I did, uh, out of self-preservation, and uh, it's a call of my heart and knew that I didn't want to contribute to all the violence inherent in meat production. Well, my body loved it. Uh, my, within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist. My high blood pressure went to normal. My high cholesterol went to normal. I felt great waking up in a nice, lean body every day. And uh, that time, I realized I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist anymore and spend my career literally putting people to sleep. I'd rather go back to uh, general practice and help them wake up because now I knew what to tell them. Now I knew why they were all getting uh, more obese and clogged up and hypertensive. And from the food, <laughs> it's the food, uh, which uh, to my dismay in the hospital saw my medical colleagues uh, wolfing down with every meal and watched their high blood pressures go up and their obesity increase. I uh, felt like working in a Fellini movie that the people trying to help are actually making themselves sick with the same foods. So anyway, I left the anesthesia, went back to general practice and found some people who could give plant-based cooking lessons. And my patients who could follow that diet and lifestyle have had the same wonderful uh, effects. They get leaner, their high blood pressures come down, their high blood sugars come down. 
and you get to deep prescribe uh, the medications they're on. No, no one ever mentioned that word to me in med school, but something we do every day now because people get healthier. It's, it's a, no one med school didn't prepare me for people getting healthy, but they do on a diet of whole plant foods. And they don't need their medication. In fact, not only can you get them off their blood pressure pill and their insulin, you have to get them off before their blood pressure crashes and their blood sugar goes too low. So it's fun. I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthy. And um, my job is, uh, is a fairly easy one with lifestyle counseling and nice lifestyle medicine. But a few years ago, uh, this is such a powerful tool. It's the most powerful tool any doctor can wield. I began thinking, you know, my colleagues, by the time I talk to them, they're already locked in to the drugs and the surgery, what I call pharmacosclerosis, that's into their brains. And ah, food, uh, they, people won't change what they eat. And they're not interested in the subject. But I say, you know, somebody needs to reach the medical students. Why would someone have told me this in medical school, that these are reversible diseases and a plant-based diet is the key uh, to reversing diseases? I wish someone had told me this. I began thinking someone should go to the med schools and tell the medical students this. And uh, the little voice on my shoulder said, how about you, doc? How about you? <laughs> and, um, and as a result, it's in 2019, started going around to the medical schools. And the students are hungry, so to speak, for this, for this information, because um, it's so empowering. In your second, third year of medical student, you want to learn how to reverse diseases. This is the most powerful tool we'll ever have to do that. So we've gotten a great reception from the medical schools. So I've spoken to 40 med schools across North America, wow. uh, into Australia, into New Zealand, into Poland. And it's the same everywhere. Uh, you know, the Western diet is metastasized around the globe, uh, and we're har reaping the grim harvest of what we're, we're seeing these formerly healthy nations with lean trim people becoming obese and diabetic, hypertensive. I gave a talk in Sri Lanka by Zoom last week uh, to a largely South Asian population. I started by apologizing as an American. I want to apologize for unleashing <laughs> the tsunami of illness upon you folks disguised as fast foods and uh, and processed uh, products. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. And now we all have to deal with the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the consequences, but you already have the answers to food you've been eating oh, for centuries before this. Go back to the plant-based foods and you'll get through this epidemic. So it's a fascinating time to be a physician and to be a teacher of medical students and to be connected with the plant-based uh, community around the world. There's getting now to be thousands of doctors awakening to the plant-based uh, mission. You meet them to through the Plantrition Project, through the College of Lifestyle Medicine, through Dr. Barnard's clinic, Dr. McDougall. It's it's a growing movement. You, you can't get the genie back in the bottle. The medicine is yes. going to be the old model cannot stand. It's crumbling. And we got a much better and tastier one uh, to put in its place. Absolutely. It's an absolute truth. And, you know, I, I say, you know, you drop a ball, it will fall to the ground. And that's an absolute truth. And, and food as medicine is an absolute truth. And, and it's what we quote Hippocrates as saying, let food be thy medicine. And so he, he knew it way back then. And Indeed, yeah, you know, it really made me shift my whole concept of disease. Where in med school you learn about the great killer disease, uh, high blood pressure, this, diabetes, this, and the, these ogres that you go do jousting and battle with and to try and slay them. But that's not really what high blood pressure is. If you've got a a gasoline burning engine in your car and you start putting in diesel fuel kerosene and you got black smoke coming out the back and the spark plugs are caking up with carbon. What do you, oh, my car's developed a disease. No, it hasn't. It's malfunctioning precisely, predictably as it would by putting the wrong fuel in an engine not designed to run on it. And that's the same thing with our bodies. We're basically We've got basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. They're up in the trees eating leaves and fruits and vegetation all day. They don't develop clogged arteries in the wild. They don't develop diabetes. They don't develop high blood pressure. Uh, but when you bring them into the zoos and you start feeding them the meat and the fast foods, yes, they get all our diseases. 
But we're plant-based eating hominids. We need to, to, if we just honor that with all these delicious plant-based foods, the diseases go away. They weren't true diseases. They were just malfunctions from the, from the wrong fuel there. And thank heavens, it's reversible. It's correctable with the uh, whole plant foods that we've been designed to eat. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's what the, the beauty of it is, is that it's pretty much reversible. Yes. Indeed. Yes. So... so Marikita, should we have people ask their own questions? I noticed that we had a couple in the chat. Would you like to read the questions or ask people to, to come on and, and ask their questions? Sure. Well, let's see. Terry, can you come on and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Dr. Klepper. Thank you so much for coming on. You're actually, uh, I know you're good friends with some friends of mine, Michael, uh, sorry, Malcolm McKay and Jenny Cameron. So I saw some photos of you cruising around America with them. They, they're having a good time while they're here. So thank you so much um, for coming today. So I actually work for a non-governmental uh, organisation called the Physicians Association for Nutrition. And we're based, well, I'm not, but they're based in Germany. And this is our whole platform to get medical students more education in nutrition. Um, so my question to you is, you were saying that the medical students were giving you a warm welcome. What about the institutions? Are you actually talking to the institutions about implementing nutrition and particularly plant-based nutrition programs into the actual med medical degrees? And if so... Are they listening? <laughs> and tell us what's going on there. Oh, my. Uh, that, of course, opens up a whole uh, can of snakes and worms and roaches and spiders uh, that's <laughs> going to come to dealing with the faculty at these medical schools. Uh, because a profound truth, if you will, no one's got a, a patent on the truth, but a profound, like, uh, like Peter said, Proud truth that a whole food plant-based diet will reverse, uh, or, you know, rest and probably reverse most of the diseases that we're spending all this time and money on. That simple truth there is is a it's a heresy. It's a th a uh, threatening stance to have uh, in with most of the current medical approaches to healing and medical education. Why it threatens their intellectual model. Do they when what's the cause of high blood pressure? We don't know. Etiology unknown, but the molecular geneticists are working out to tease out those genes that, in the presence of such as uh, pesticides in the environment, plus a, a lack of magnesium, is going to produce an evasive constraint. You know, they're they're tuned in on that level, and and the thought that cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizzas and buffalo wings might be clogging up their patients' arteries. This is too abstruse a concept for them to understand but they're you know they're they're as you know the, the molecular model is satisfying and it's lucrative there's whole lots of government grants and university grants coming in to to uh, 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 to fund that and and it's effective you, know, you stay on these potent medications you can force that blood pressure down that's true it doesn't really extend life. And what other side effect? What are you doing to their kidney function? What are you doing to their liver function? What are you doing to their immune system? Well, we have, you know, wait five years. We'll see if there's a big oops, you know, as there so often is. But so it's threatening to them on an intellectual level, on a financial level, um, and, and the structural level of, of how medicine is taught. And so, and there's a lot of people who would lose money. They're, they're, we're talking about fewer by, cardiac bypasses being done, fewer cardiac stents placed, fewer people on dialysis, fewer people needing insulin. Um, it, it, it's going to cause a major uh, economic shift in the entire multi-trillion dollar medical industry. So they don't want to go there, and it's threatening to them. So it's easy for them to stand in the back of the room and shake their heads and say, well, show me 15 double-blind placebo-controlled uh, studies showing that broccoli is healthier than candy bars. I want to see those 15 studies right now. Uh, and, um, and of course, nutrition education is the one science that doesn't lend itself to those kind of studies. People know what they, you can't do a double-blind study. It's very hard. People know if they're eating broccoli or they're not. 
uh, and people eat, they eat foods in different combinations that change the effect in the body. They don't eat the same thing over time. They, they're constantly changing their food. Uh, what's in the water? How does that influence their microbiome? There's so many variables that it's easy for them to scoff and say, well, you can't give me those gold standard studies and your whole science is, is soft California woo-woo stuff. Uh, and the truth is, uh, it's just the opposite. You know, these are the folks with all the purity in their hearts. And God knows if you're having a bill heart attack, a, a good cardiologist with a catheter can, can save your life by putting that stent in. I'm all for acute medicine when it's needed. Uh, but by and large, uh, these is, is largely Band-Aid treatments, the vascular procedures and the, and the diabetes control. Uh, and um, and I have a slide, and, and we see these dramatic actual reversals with a healthy diet and lifestyle, plant-based diet and lifestyle, that I have a slide in my, at the end of my slideshow to the med students and to the doctors who are watching. And I say, I'm going to ask, a, pose a controversial question right now. And I, say, I put a list up of all the, of the classic diseases. We're all treating obesity, hypertension, diabetes, clogged arteries, inflammatory diseases. And the slide says, knowing how reversible the majority of these diseases that you're going to spend most of your time medical energy treating, knowing how reversible they are. And I click the slide and it says, you want to heal these patients or you just want to manage their chronic disease? You want to heal these patients? Then get real about why they're sitting in front of you, doctor. Overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed from what they're running through their arteries every four hours from the burgers and the buffalo wings and the McMuffins and the, uh, and the steady stream of cooked animal fats and proteins and concentrated sugars and salts and oils and processed chemicals, this toxic food stream, I call it the red tide that flushes through our system, our tissues with every fast food meal. And most of our patients are eating one or more of those meals daily. Uh, the damage that it does to our DNA, to our enzymes, to our, you know, uh, to our, our poor body spends all day trying to damp down inflammatory reactions and, and not overshoot uh, immune disease reactions so that it does not set off autoimmune diseases. We, uh, we, we drink alcohol and drink and uh, eat emulsifiers and the candy bars that make our gut leaky. Uh, we eat commercial produce sprayed with glyphosate. That increases the leaky gut. Uh, you know, modern life is an assault you know, on, on, on the natural homeostasis we used to have when we were out on the Kentucky frontier in our garden, or even today, I mean, just being out in the country in, in a garden, even in, in your backyard in the city, you know, get outside in, in nature and, and reconnect there. So, you know, we brought this mostly on ourselves with our diet and lifestyle, with all the good intentions in the world, we painted ourselves into quite a nutritional and disease corner here. But it's not, not unfixable. The truth is the truth. Uh, so going back to your question, so how does the faculty accept this? First of all, we don't, uh, uh, we don't with rare exceptions, uh, we don't uh, deal with the faculty uh, in that. Um, thanks to you folks, uh, to people doing social media, and the wonderful film producers that have put out these wonderful uh, flicks in every medical school uh, class now, there's 20 or 30 medical students. They've seen films, they've seen Forks Over Knives, they've seen What the Health, they've seen The Game Changers, The Lights On, they, they know something shaking with, uh, with plant-based nutrition. And um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, bless them, um, have what's called Lifestyle Medicine Interest Groups, LMIGs, LMIGs, uh, at many, many medical schools and hospitals around the country. And these are interested medical students and residents and interns who really are interested uh, in the plant-based uh, diet and lifestyle. And so we, uh, so we find out who's the head of the LMIG at your hospital there. And we uh, and I go to the, we'll connect with them directly. And so we go in and we, we contact the students right directly and we just kind of bypass the, uh, uh, the, <laughs> uh, the faculty. Now, how do we, now, what do we do with that? How do we optimize that? Uh, I tell the students, listen, this is a bottom-up revolution. 
Uh, we got to get it out into the public. Yes. So people change what they're buying and what they're shop, uh, what they're ordering in the restaurants. And in school, in medical school, when you're in the clinic, ask your professor when you're in diabetes clinic, do you think this person's high fat diet is contributing to their insulin resistance, doctor? When you're in hypertensive or cardiovascular clinic, do you think this person's high salt, high sugar, diet, high fat diet is contributing to their clogged arteries, professor? Uh, I happen to run into a study showing the reversibility of this. What do you think of this article? Start bringing it into your clinical awareness and, and it's, it's, it becomes a thing, you know, a meme, the uh, uh, disease reversal through plant-based nutrition. Now that's what I'm trying to instill in their heads. You know, 10 years ago, nobody knew about the microbiome. You know, now everybody knows, but uh, we're trying to get disease reversal through plant-based nutrition <laughs> the same on the same level there. And um, so finally, the real issue that you're asking about, uh, they don't want to talk, teach it in schools. They plead, listen, the curriculum's so full, there's no room in our curriculum to even put nutrition courses in. And the National Board of Medical Examiners doesn't ask about nutrition on the board exams. Now, when they start asking about nutrition on the national boards, we'll start teaching it. So, okay, so we went to the National Board of Medical Examiners and said, what do you need to uh, get uh, nutrition questions on the National Board exam? They said, but yeah, it was so dismaying to you. We don't know anything about nutrition. You guys, know, <laughs> we have no idea what to put on there, doctor. Um, you guys make up the questions and bring them to us. And so then there in College of Lifestyle Medicine, where we set up committees and uh, put together a pool of a thousand questions and to bring to uh, the national board. They said they're gonna be reviewing them and starting getting them into uh, um, uh, onto the national board exams. I'm, uh, I've got my fingers crossed that it's not just take the skin off the chicken and use skim milk and uh, pour olive oil <laughs> and everything. I hope, I hope they, you know, they really make the appropriate question choice, but at least, you know, uh, an inch is important. These are important inches of progress right now. They, um, <laughs> we got to keep riding herd on it, but, you know, they say when the, um, when the dog plays the violin, don't criticize the quality of the playing. You know, <laughs> that they're playing it at all is a wonderful thing. And the fact that they're starting to get nutrition questions on the board exam is a wonderful thing. But we will stay on their case till, till I don't have to do this anymore, till all medical students are, are taught this. It, it should be in every year of medical school. The first year, it, it involves anatomy, the digestion, the physiology, how it functions, pathology, the diseases that come there. And then through the clinical years, in every clinic, pediatric clinic, surgery, the internal medicine, they're all dealing with nutrition-based diseases from what their patients are eating. So uh, we got to get this permeating through the whole system, but it'll happen. And patients need to ask their doctors, what yes. should I be? Bring your patients, bring your doctors, these lovely books on uh, and handouts that you can get off the Plantrition workshop, uh, website. PCRM has them. Um, we'll be making some up that, uh, and do it yourself, you know, make your doctor ask, you know, you get on a plant-based diet, you, you get off your pills, you trim down your weight, well, the doctor should ask. If they don't ask, find a different doctor. Exactly. Thank you. That that's that's such amazing information and so true and so sad and so. But you know, there's hope. So there's it's sad and yet there's hope. And thank Absolutely. you for that. And I know uh, a doctor, uh, a doctor who uh, who went to his fiftieth year reunion at medical school. And this is, and you, I think you've met him too, Dr. Greg Feinsinger in Carbondale, Colorado. And he, he went to his medical school reunion in Denver. And they, of course, they hit him up for, for a donation. And, and God bless him. What he did was he said, you know, I'm more than happy to give you money. And you need to put in a nutrition program into your curriculum. And that worked. And I haven't updated with him for a while, and I look forward to getting the update. But, but they're they're working on it. So, so that's money talks, right? <laughs> so it does, no doubt. Yes. Uh, yes. But the truth talks as well. If people are interested in what the we're doing, talks, uh, yes. go to uh, movingmedforward.com. Our organization, our nonprofit, is Moving Medicine Forward. Go to movingmedforward.com, and you can read about what we're doing and how you can yeah. help them. Yeah. So, Marikita, what's 
who's got our next question? I think we, we've got lots of questions pouring in. People want to hear from Dr. Clapper. Right. All right. So I've got one from Jeff. Let me just go ahead and read them. <laughs> has the emerging research inclusive of has the emerging research inclusive of vegan, vegans help other practitioners and the medical community be more receptive? Oh, there's no question. And there's been a paucity, a dearth, a lack of, of good medical studies on vegans. They are different biological creatures. Uh, I've got a slide in my presentation on mechanisms of disease reversal of plant-based nutrition. What changes when you go from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet? Everything changes. The blood viscosity changes. The oxidative load changes. The uh, the hormone levels change. The blood viscosity change. Everything changes. And uh, and if you raise a child as a vegan, and I and I know many of them now, um, delivered a few myself in my earlier years. Um, they are different biochemical creatures. Their livers have matured with different enzyme capabilities. They have a different gut microbiome. They've got a different physiology uh, in, their, in their muscle metabolism. Certainly their nerve metabolism, hormone levels are different. Uh, and to, to lump them all in uh, with this, the standard Americans and uh, so they, well, everybody lives to be, you know, the, these are the major diseases, not in this population. Uh, and uh, I, th I think I would love, you know, I could kick myself, I could turn back the time machine to back when I was 35, I would start a, a, a directory, uh, a compendium of uh, people who've been raised as vegans since birth, and uh, find out what happens to these folks, what diseases they have, what uh, what, what do they eventually die of, uh, what's, uh, what's the reality of that, but I suspect they're are going to be a very healthy population free of most of these degenerative diseases. Uh, in the uh, in the EPIC study in, in England, uh, they have a significant population of vegans, uh, and they have a significant incidence of heart disease and cancer, etc. Vegans are certainly not immune from cancer. But they, but you never know when a person calls themselves vegan. They, it may have been they've been vegan for three weeks and they're now in that category. But they've had fifty years of of standard Western eating that kindled these disease processes. So uh, it's hard to extrapolate from those studies that do have a, a vegan population. How long have they been vegan? What are they really, really eating? I've got a few junk food vegans who are, who are living on granola bars and energy drinks and their cholesterol through the roof, their triglycerides through the roof. Uh, they've got clogged arteries, but they're vegan for the animals, not helping either the animals or themselves uh, unless they really get themselves healthy. So uh, so when I see well, the, you know, the incidence of disease within vegans, well, I got to know more about that vegan population. What are they really eating and for how long? But yes, it would help if well done vegan studies. I'm all for it. Let's get them funded. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for that. Marquita, who's next? Okay. Well, I got another question from Jeff. So I've got, how has the new understandings about plant exclusive compounds like fiber and polyphenols and other phytochemicals and subsequent microbiome changes influenced the call for more plant foods? Oh my, uh, what a wonderful question. And it really reflects great understanding um, in the question asker's mind about the wonderful complexity of uh, the foods that we're eating and what they contain. Uh, you know, we've all seen, you know, lists that would go down your arm of all the phytonutrients to just in, among the polyphenols. You could, I'm sure there are chemists who make an entire career of studying polyphenols. And, and it's, uh, when you look at food that way, it's like fractals in mathematics. The closer you look, the more it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. And it's wonderful and magical, but it's also, you know, an infinitely confusing rabbit hole after a while. So much so that uh, when you look at all the interactions that all these chemicals have, you know, the, you know, the permutations and combinations get to be in the billions. And so it made Dr. Colin Campbell, one of the elders of the food movement, to pull back and write this book called Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And his plea in that book is stop micronizing all the 
the components, yes, they, they have properties and some of them can be useful, but everything that you take in sets off cascades of reactions throughout the body cells that really have no idea. Uh, and every food, you know, people don't eat single nutrients. You eat squash and beans and rice and 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 follow it with a with a mango. Well, you know, there's a, a millions of combinations of all those chemicals uh, just in your stomach, and then your digestive enzymes add yeah, their magic, and then there's all the trillion organisms in your microbiome and your colon that are going to further change it. Um, and he's saying, stop driving yourself nuts. It's the whole food stream coming in. Is it generally rich in whole plant foods? Is it generally alkaline in nature? Is it generally low in sugars? Is it generally moderate in fats? It's like, you know, back to that automotive analogy. If it's high grade gasoline, you're probably going to be okay. Um, planetary considerations aside. Uh, but um, so eat a whole food, plant-based food stream. I'm sure that should be a, a, a accepted litany by now, but for good reason, you know, let nature, let your body, let your microbes sort out uh, all the individual uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, but, you know, tr trust that it knows what it's doing, but if you're a pure vegan, don't, uh, don't skimp on vitamin B12, that is important. Uh, and get some vitamin D and get out in the sunshine for a half hour every day if, if you live in uh, latitudes that will you know, permit that. So um, yes, uh, there ain't life grand. I mean, isn't food grand? I mean, it's just, you know, it's so complex. Enjoy it, make, make it colorful, make it filling, make it whole food, make it high in fiber and trust your body. It'll, it'll know what to do with it. Your colon will tell you. Beautiful. Amen to that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you got into the details and, and looking at the details. I, I was talking with somebody recently who asked the question and, and they invited me to ask you is uh, to diabetes, the thing about diabetes and sugar in the blood. I mean, clearly diabetes is not caused by sugar in the blood or, you know, so so who discovered what diabetes is really about and and, and what and what's the what's the overview of what really goes on with diabetes? Right, you know, we get this litany that oh, we got diabetes, you got high blood sugar, don't eat blood sugar, don't eat sugar, that's the problem. And we shouldn't be eating sugar as a food. You know, it's a little bit as a flavoring is one thing, but don't when you're eating a vegan donut or a cupcake, you're eating a chunk of sugar. Don't eat it as a food. Uh, it's uh, it, it floods your tissues. It sticks to your proteins. It ages your tissues. It's not a food. Don't eat sugar as a food. Um, that said, uh, that's not the primary problem in diabetes, and it was shown in 1927 by J. Shirley Sweeney at Yale University. Uh, he's a professor of internal medicine, and uh, he was teaching his medical students, and he did a, a profound, quick, easy study that, that to this just changed my whole understanding of diabetes. Uh, he took medical students. Uh, they were all young men at the time uh, in the 1920s in the Northeast. Uh, and half the medical students he put on a high carbohydrate diet, nothing but white bread, literally white bread, table sugar, jelly, uh, and, uh, and cornstarch uh, gruel for, for two days, for 48 hours, just pure fine carbohydrates. Uh, he then, at the end of 48 hours of all the carbohydrates, um, he he did a glucose tolerance test. He gave them each, and we do it today. We give them, they have a drink of 100 grams of glucose. Uh, that's a few, a few tablespoons of it. Uh, and two hours later, check the blood sugar. If your pancreas is healthy and your insulin receptors are healthy, within those two hours, your blood sugar is going to go up, but then the pancreas puts out insulin and the, the insulin, the sugar is metabolized. And by the end of two hours, your sugar levels should be below 120, but in the 100 milliliter range, 100 milligram range, which is about what we started with. So up, down within two hours, and you ought to be back to normal uh, within uh, two hours. Um, and uh, he gave that test to the students who ate all their sugar, and they all came back healthy young men, normal. Uh, by two hours, they were all back below 120. 
He then, the other group, he put on a high fat diet for two days, nothing but butter and olive oil and uh, um, uh, goat cheese and uh, uh, just, uh, just pure fat. Uh, and after 48 hours of that, he did a glucose tolerance test. They gave him 100 grams of glucose. Two hours later, every one of them had blood sugars, 190, 220, 240. They were all in diabetic range. Um, and now they're healthy young guys. They started eating regular food again. It all, it all normalized. But it was a profound demonstration of what a high fat diet will do to your insulin receptors. It clogs up the, the insulin receptors in your liver and your muscles that keep, uh, keep you from burning up sugar. It keeps insulin uh, from uh, moving sugar from the bloodstream into the, into the cells where it can be burned. It's type two diabetes, insulin resistance from a high fat diet it, from the the egg yolks and then the egg McMuffin and the bacon fat and for breakfast and lunch with the burgers and the fries and the shakes and the animal fats and the cheese and the mayonnaise and the bun and the vegetable oil and the fries, all that fat. It's, we, we eat a high fat diet and uh, peaches full of cheese and sauce, et cetera. And so we're walking around with clogged up insulin receptors. And so there's type two diabetes. And there's all these medicines to try and knock that down and make the pancreas put out more insulin, et cetera. But Neil Barnard and others just shown, hey, you know, the gorillas don't develop this. They eat a high carb diet. They don't develop diabetes. Get on the rice and beans and fruits and veggies. And guess what? A low, moderately low fat diet allows the insulin receptors to clear out and suddenly insulin starts working again. And the diabetes goes away, type two diabetes. It's reversible disease. Who knew? I wish someone had told me that. And now when you think of the hundreds of billions of dollars, people are injecting insulin and, and suffering blindness and amputations from this reversible disease. They're walking around with, with high blood sugars from all the fat and sugar they're eating. Now, once your diet, once your insulin receptors are clogged up with the saturated fats, et cetera, then eating sugar on top of that, ooh, well, sky high. I mean, the, the fat sugar combo is particularly lethal all the time. There's certainly an obesity, but it makes diabetes much worse. But even you know, the pure sugars aren't as bad as the pure fats. There. So I'm not saying never eat fats. I mean, have a handful of walnuts. You know, it's okay to put avocado on your salad, um, but um, don't don't eat, don't shovel five pounds of cashews in uh, in front of the TV. There, you know, easy does it. Uh, but, but get your fat out of whole foods. Another reason I'm not a big fan of vegetable oils, coconut oil, etc. They don't do great things for your insulin receptors like, like most fats don't. So type 2 diabetes is a disease of fat toxicity, uh, not sugar toxicity. Whole plant foods, diabetes usually goes away, type 2. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Marikita, what, what do you have next for Dr. Clapper? Okay, James is asking, what effect will a whole foods plant-based diet have on cancer in the early stages? Oh my, boy, you got some smart folks asking some good questions. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, uh, this is uh, a very obviously complex issue here, and there's so much to talk about. Um, but by but starting with the most general uh, advice I can give or observations I can make. Uh, when I grew up, I was a little kid, and my relatives had cancer. I watched them shrink away from uh, this dreadful wasting condition called cachexia. Uh, and, and that is so frightening to, to the patient, but to the family and to the doctors to watch their patient get, become cachectic. That what's the, uh, what's the human and medical reaction? Oh, man, eat, get, eat, get those calories in. They have all the ice cream you want. Have all the meat you want. Let's go to Burger King. Let's like, get those calories in. We don't want you wasting away. And with all the love in their heart and good intentions, you know, that's what's done. But little did we realize that uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things in that high protein animal based food stream that makes things worse. Uh, the um, uh, it's becoming evident that uh, the cancer cells burn sugars. So when we do a PET scan, a positron tomography scan, looking for cancer cells, what do we do? We give the person a radioactive label of sugar that's taken up by the cancer cells and it shows up on the scan. 
So a real demonstration that sugar, your cancer cells like sugar, and Dr. Warburg showed us that in the 1930s. Um, well, what, what's in a fast food diet? Everything's got sugar from the hamburger buns to the ketchup to the drink, et cetera. So it's a high sugar diet that feeds the cancer. But very importantly, when a person eats meat, <clears throat> cancer or not, all the amino acids in the animal muscle flow up into the liver. The liver gets all these amino acids and the liver thinks, hmm, all these amino acid building blocks, let's build something with them. And in response, the liver puts out a surge of this hormone called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. Uh, and it's the most one of the most powerful growth promoting hormones in the body. And it's great if you're a growing girl, a growing guy, man, you want lots of IGF-1 for your growing body. But if you're a woman with an early breast cancer or a guy with a big prostate and some malignant cells there, the last thing you want is a diet that makes your body walk around with high levels of IGF-1. And that's exactly what, um, the, uh, what a high protein diet, uh, animal protein diet does. Uh, beans and other protein rich plant foods don't seem to create that much IGF-1. And folks eat dairy products. They think cheese and ice cream are healthy or at least good for the cancer patient. Well, this is baby calf growth fluid. The mother cow is giving her calf to blow that calf up into a great big dairy cow. Uh, it's um, Dairy products are full of IGF-1 and growth promoting hormones. That's what it's about. And so why would you want to be eating that stuff if you've got a cancer growing somewhere? So um, does a plant-based diet offer something for people with cancer? One, absolutely, just by the fact that it, is, it should be low in sugars, low in fats that I think uh, can cause the hormonal disruptions that may aid the cancer growth. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, IGF-1 levels that come from meat and dairy. So whole food plant-based diet allows that to, to recede. Um, there are, of course, uh, foods that seem to uh, help the immune system, and they get hard to do double-blind placebo-controlled studies on patients. With you know, Everyone's got a different kind of cancer. They may eat different kinds of mushrooms, different amounts. It's so hard to do these standardized studies to make any definitive study uh, the statements about it. But a diet like with uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Joel Perman's got a lovely G-bombs there, and, uh, and the especially the onions and the mushrooms uh, and the dark greens are really important uh, to uh, to have on a daily diet. He's got this wonderful, if you do a Google on Dr. Furman's anti-cancer soup, and it's filled with greens and mushrooms and, and herbs that uh, would kind of give the chemical message to your cells of, shh, you know, calm down. They kind of seem to stabilize membranes, a lot of helpful phytonutrients in that. Uh, and finally, uh, so yes, a, a, a whole food plant-based diet would be very beneficial for the cancer patient for what it doesn't have is what it should have, the lignans, et cetera, are stabilizing in general. <laughs> and finally, uh, one who trained at True North for a while, where I've supervised hundreds and hundreds of water fasts, little did I realize what a potent tool this can be in <laughs> Uh, when uh, we had a patient come in um, with a uh, advanced lymphoma, she had lymph nodes in her arms and her groins the size of hen's eggs, uh, and she was sick with lymphoma. She did a 30, uh, 32 day water fast, and then I jumped on a whole food plant based diet. Those tumors just melted away. I couldn't, uh, uh, stunning to me as a physician to see this. Uh, and now, people don't have to do long, long fast. Dr. Walter Longo and others have shown that uh, the shorter fast done repeatedly can, uh, uh, can be beneficial. But very importantly, finally, to put a bow on it, uh, uh, if I had an early cancer, would I do a three-day fast every other weekend or a five-day fast uh, once or twice a month? Yes, I'd consider that. There's something to consider about giving medical advice. Uh, but also... Uh, I, I think the studies are now showing that, um, that the fasting state um, makes chemotherapy work better. And when, when, after 48 hours on water, uh, the, the person's healthy stem cells are kind of hunkered down, filled with antioxidants, but cancer cells can't do that. And so they stay susceptible. So when the chemo comes in, they get zocked a lot more than the person's own cells do. 
So I've been telling the uh, patients, you know, they don't even want to mention anything to the oncologist. But if you're scheduled for an IV chemo or even a radiation therapy, go in on day two of a water fast or day three of a water fast. You're going to get more therapeutic benefit from the treatment, and you're going to have less nausea, less side effects. You're going to feel less bad uh, after the chemo there. So fasting has a little niche for itself in, in cancer therapy, uh, as does a whole food plant-based diet. So uh, uh, you got the whole package there. Read about, uh, uh, if you're interested, Dr. Walter Longo, L-O-N-G-O. If you Google him, Longo in cancer, you'll uh, you'll see his protocols for using that. But the fasting state is beneficial if you're going to tangle with that disease. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, what's next, Marquita? Okay. All right. So actually, this is my question. My best friend passed away from heart, I mean, like heart attack without, I mean, there were warnings, but what would have been the best test, you know, to know what stage of heart disease somebody would be in if, it's, if, if they have no idea to ask for it from their physician? Right. Um, the two minimum tests I would order uh, is turning out that we're talking about atherosclerotic heart disease here, uh, yes. Um, it turns out the, the particle that uh, causes the most damage getting into the walls of the artery is oxidized cholesterol. We all make cholesterol, uh, but when it becomes oxidized, it has uh, uh, electrons ripped off of it. Um, and that's a particularly uh, uh, atherogenic particle that gets in the walls of the arteries and sets off plaque formation. So I'd want to know the level of oxidized cholesterol. And when the oxidized cholesterol gets in the wall of the artery, um, the process of plaque formation is an inflammatory process. It's an inflammatory disease. Uh, and as a result, inflammatory markers start showing up in the bloodstream. And the one most commonly used is high sensitivity C-reactive protein or HSCRP. Uh, and um, uh, that you want that less than 1.0. Um, if you've got a HSCRP of, of four and a, uh, an oxidized cholesterol significantly elevated, you're, you're at risk. Uh, and, um, but again, the beans and the greens, you know, and you know, the, the most common so, I mean, you're assuming that we're all whole food plant-based, but if you're not, the most common source of oxidized cholesterol is in the meat. Nobody eats raw meat. The very act of putting that burger on the grill, that putting the steak under the broiler, dumping that chicken carcass into the hot fryer oil. When you cook animal muscle at high temperature, you're going to oxidize cholesterol. That's really where the oxidized cholesterol is coming from. If you're vegan, then all the cholesterol in your blood is put there by your own liver for its own reason. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be very much oxidized cholesterol at all. If there is, what are you eating? There might be oxidizing. Are you eating fried foods? Are you, are you a vegan potato chip fan? Are you a French fry fan? Onion rings? Are, are you eating fried foods, eating processed foods? What's what might be oxidizing your own cholesterol? Whatever it is, stop eating it and eat a lot more greens and beans and fruits and veggies. And uh, it should lower your risk and clean out your arteries. All right, thank you. All right, so we got another question from Tracy. Um, she says, hi, Dr. Clapper, are there any foods in particular that you would recommend for cancer survivors to try to consume daily? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, again, uh, Kudos and recognition to Dr. Furman. Uh, I would use his G bombs as a uh, uh, as a guide. They are just so rich in antioxidants and, and phytonutrients, plant nutrients that's that's that give the chemical message to the cells to, that stabilize memories, that promote tissue repair. They give the chemical message of shh, <laughs> calm down. And uh, so, uh, G uh, dark leafy greens. He have something dark and green every day. Well, whether it's the romaine or lettuce and, and the lettuce and the salad, but preferably cruciferous vegetables, kale, collards, um, uh, bok choy, broccoli, um, uh, and the uh, the oxalate containing ones, chard, spinach, just once a week, twice a week. But the other guys you know, have, have them frequently. Um, B is for berries. Uh, man, we can get organic berries all year. What a blessing for whatever uh, uh, 
uh, we can say about the food distribution system, it does make those organic berries available in the, in the, in the fridge case every day. So, man, we go through a lot of berries. Uh, um, uh, Elise will bring home you know, two boxes of blueberries, two boxes of raspberries, two of blackberries. And we're throwing them in the cereal. We're making smoothies with them. We, uh, uh, we, we have them for dessert at night. Instead of ice cream, we'll put some berries, a little oat milk on them. And uh, so eat, eat a, little, a lot of those berries. In the, and boy, you throw a box of berries and a banana and some almond milk in the, in the blender. And just instant uh, antioxidant smoothie there. Uh, so the, the greens and the bees are berries, always for onions, and uh, we eat a lot of onions and garlic, and there's a wonderful aroma when you when you kind of start sauteing onions in the, uh, in the wok there, but we use vegetable broth instead of, uh, instead of oil. Uh, G-B-O-M is for mushrooms, mayo, and uh, thanks to Dr. Furman, but to my wonderful wife, uh, she is bringing home these different mushrooms every week. Uh, that I didn't even know existed, the turkey tails and head of the woods and lion's mane and shiitake and miyatake. And um, she makes all these great mushroom gravies. And, uh, and uh, then we pour it over mashed potatoes, over rice and things. So uh, let's hear it for the O, uh, G, B, O, M, is mushrooms. Uh, uh, B is, uh, uh, did I miss another B there? B or is it, uh, or is it, oh, just, or just, B -O -M beans. Beans. Oh, I'm sorry. Beans. Yes. We eat a lot of you. Thank you. Uh, how can I forget the great God of beans is going to visit me tonight <laughs> or my dreams here? Um, but um, yeah, we uh, we need them uh, for every level. The more you read about beans, the more I love them the, uh, for their protein value. It's gentle protein, but still concentrated. But the lignin uh, fibers and the resistant starches, there is so much good about it. And it's our meat. It's, it's those that meaty, chewy, high protein food that uh, that's so versatile, the chilies and the stews and the soups and the uh, uh, burritos that we eat. Uh, and, um, and the last S is G B O M B. Oh, is that the end of it there? G B O M B. Yeah, that's it. I guess <laughs> there's no S at the end of it there. Okay. So uh, yeah, eat a bunch of those. But seriously, I have a big vegetable soup <laughs> going out the stove. Uh, throw all sorts of greens and mushrooms and and uh, some little quinoa in there if you like it. And have a big salad every day. And get that steamer, that Instapot going, and steam up some broccoli every day, and and you know put some balsamic vinegar on it. And we keep it pretty simple, but man, it's cheap. But boy, it's filling and great leftovers. And um, uh, and I'm lucky to have uh, good food in the house. Not no thanks to me. I um, but uh, <laughs> I earned the money. But she does the cooking. God love her. Um, the uh, one of our friends, we were visiting a friend, uh, Larry, who's a very good cook, and uh, he made a, just a dynamite uh, stew for us. And uh, I said, isn't it great to have a husband who knows how to cook like that, Elise? Don't you wish you had one? Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I promised her I would learn to make two dishes a week. So I'm going to start doing that. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Let's see. We've got a question from Stuart. Um, we have a little more time. So what are your thoughts on intermittent, intermittent fasting? Uh, I'm generally in favor of not, not eating. We spend, you know, eating has become a recreational activity and we're constantly uh, shoving things down our digestive system. And especially when you eat late at night, you know, you go to bed, your muscles relax, your brain goes to sleep, but your digestive system working all night, dealing with all, uh, all the stuff you just put down there. Uh, in general, the animals, you know, very few of them eat at night. They're, you know, by, some, by sundown, the animals are going to sleep. We should too. And, and, and enough with the eating. Uh, by Be done with eating by five or six in general. Unless you, you know, if you're working in the hospital and you don't get home till 10, that's something else. But if you live a, a semi-diurnal day, if you can get up with the, with the sun, and I, I put off uh, breakfast as long as possible. If I'm not hungry by 9 or 10 or 11, that's fine. I wait till I get hungry. Is there an advantage to that? Yes, I've been fasting all night. And if I don't eat during those morning hours, some beneficial changes are happening in my body for a few hours 
um, the sirtuin levels are going up and IGF-1 levels are going down and uh, it'll get into a complete ketotic fasting state, but generally good things are going, antioxidants are increasing. So that's the benefit of quote intermittent fasting. It's the it's more accurately time restricted feeding. If you just if you don't eat from you know say six in the evening uh, dinner, you don't eat till six in the morning. It's twelve hours, and then if you can hold off till eleven or noon, as there's a total of eighteen hours that you fasted. That's an so an eighteen hour fasting chunk has been ins inserted into your day intermittently there. So that's the way to do an intermittent fasting. Another version of that is, as I mentioned earlier, I have friends who every other weekend from Friday night till, till Sunday morning or Sunday evening, uh, they just drink water or vegetable broth and they'll just insert uh, a short fast uh, into, their, uh, uh, into their monthly calendar. And they get more, little, I think more benefit by, by 48 hours, they're starting to get into official ketosis. And, and I think it's a beneficial thing. I think our body remembers those ancient days a million years ago on the African plains where uh, uh, three or four days might go by before you found your, your uh, foraging group found the next berry bush with fruit on it. And, uh, and the body was probably pretty used to shifting into fasting gear for a few days uh, with no sugars coming in and then, then eating uh, you know, a, a day or two or three later. And I think good things happen to us. As I mentioned, the IGF-1 levels go down and inflammation goes down. Uh, so uh, it's a, uh, a physiologic adaption that our body has developed. And I think it's good to call on it, you know, once or twice a month uh, or on a mini daily basis with the intermittent fasting. But don't make yourself crazy. If you wake up and you are famished, then you have a cantaloupe, eat something. I mean, you know, it's not a matter of, there's no failure here. You know, you're a natural human being. Listen to your body if it's within reason. The, the, the nutrition should not be an anxiety producing event. I like that. Yes. Well, uh, we're coming up on, on our hour and uh, uh, any, any final questions, any final thoughts, any uh, Dr. Clapper, any, anything you'd like to share in closing? Um. I would, um, let's see, uh, Stuart Walner still here? Um, no, he's, yes. Yeah, he's, he's still here. A uh, couple of things. We have some very special guests here. And I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to offend anybody. I know you are all accomplished folks. Who are, if you are aware enough to have been tuned into this event, you, you, you are uh, well on your plant-based journey and you're I'm undoubtedly making wonderful contributions. Um, in, in your own ways. And I apologize if I leave anybody out. I, I just run across Stuart Walner's wonderful book uh, called Escape the Meat Matrix. And uh, going through it, man, he's making some great points here and good for him uh, for, um, uh, for writing this book. And he's been with us here. And I want to recognize uh, Jeff Palmer. Um, uh, Jeff has, uh, by his example in his writings, uh, has been a really a, a, a light of uh, a vegan fitness and health and strength just by who he is and the example he says. And he's written some very interesting, thought-provoking articles on nutrition, DHA, uh, metabolism, etc. And uh, he's an unsung stalwart in our movement here. I just want to acknowledge him and thank him uh, for, for his good work. He's been a mentor of mine. I've learned a lot from him. And so take advantage, go to his website and check out his writing series. His heart's in the right place. And to all of you, to Peter and to uh, uh, Mar 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 Marikita, sorry, Marikita, sorry. Uh, thank you for making this uh, available to everyone. Uh, eat plants, be a good example, and make it a make it a better world. Uh, I'm going to try and get as many vegan doctors out there as possible. If you want to help our work, uh, go to movingmedforward.com. Other than that, uh, every plant-based meal you eat makes yourself healthier. Uh, spare some animals uh, from those dreadful sheds, and uh, and helps to make uh, helps to heal our world and all the kids who we owe so much to at this point. So uh, thank you, and uh, I'm sure we'll meet down the road there. All your yeah. Care. Thank, thank you so much, and thank you for being with us. And everybody, uh, please join us as, as Dr. Clappers, our advisor for, for a special interest uh, project, PassionPod, to, to advocate plant-based uh, 
lifestyle with our doctors. So looking for asking questions. So I, I and we'll figure out some strategies. So please please be involved with us, help us figure out these strategies. I don't know if that's uh, what questions to ask or how to find the appropriate moment, the appropriate information, but Dr. Clapper is going to help us uh, move medicine forward into our doctor's office, plant-based plan medicine into our doctor's office. So, uh, And with that, Marikita, the Matrix here, uh, is tomorrow evening. Would you Would you like to plug that for a second? Sure. Stuart is our guest here, um, Escape the Matrix. And you have the book, Stuart? I guess, well, Dr. Clapper just held it up. But anyway, so please join us tomorrow at 7 Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to be talking to Stuart about his book. And I mean, continuing the conversation on how to inspire others that are struggling so much in their health and see how we can make a difference. And I'm really looking forward to that. So join us tomorrow at 7 Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. We did it at Health's YouTube channel. And thank you all for everything you're doing. Together, we're making a difference. And thank you for your lead, Dr. Clapper, giving us the inspiration we need on this beautiful Monday. Yes, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Namaste, vegan, everyone. Yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>